Okay, everyone, just want to welcome you back to Monday Night Bible Class. This is going to be class uh, 21 in our series on God's absolute sovereignty and yet human freedom and responsibility. Very controversial, very complicated uh, topics and yet very important topics for us to discuss and think about and pray about. And we just want to keep on plugging away, uh, plowing through the book of Romans, Romans 9, 10, and 11. And tonight we want to begin Romans chapter 10. And before we do that, we want to commit our time to the Lord's care because this is going to be a disaster if His Holy Spirit does not visit us and help us, right? We agree to that. Uh, Human wisdom, human strength, human insight, autonomous uh, human reason is a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, Psalm 94 and verse 11 says, God says, he knows the thoughts of man, and they are vanity, and it is God who teaches man knowledge. So let's ask for his help tonight, and we can look forward to an enjoyable evening together. So let's pray. Our dear, blessed, and holy God of heaven, how grateful we are, Lord, for your abiding presence in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that uh, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Thank you that he has paid our sin debt in full, and we are washed clean of all sin and unrighteousness by the blood of Christ. Thank you for his atoning work on the cross. Thank you for his resurrection from the dead for our justification. And thank you, Lord, for the abiding Holy Spirit who authored the Bible. And now we pray, God, in Jesus' precious name that the Holy Spirit who authored the Bible would visit us today in power to open its pages to us and to help us understand. And, uh, Lord, we, we pray in faith that this will be enjoyable and helpful to everyone, that we would grow in our faith, grow in grace, grow in our knowledge of God and of his ways, that we might be more capable, confident ambassadors for Christ and defenders of the gospel. And we pray all these things for God's glory. And in Jesus' name, we commit it to your care. Amen. 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 Praise God. All right, friends, we are in Romans, the 10th chapter. And remember that uh, we... (laughs) We're sort of in this, um, it's a bit of a parenthesis in the epistle to the Romans. Remember, Romans chapters 1 to 8 outline for us the problem and the solution that mankind faces. The problem, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The solution, Jesus Christ and Him crucified and resurrected. The blood of Christ washes away our sin debt. So the sin uh, debt is taken care of, no problem. But we still have the sin nature. It disqualifies us from heaven. You can't go to heaven with a sin nature. You destroy heaven. So Romans chapter 8 goes on to explain that those of us who have come into a love-trust relationship with Jesus, we have received the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, who is actually called Christ. So closely associated is the Holy Spirit with the person and ministry of Jesus. He's actually called Christ, the Spirit of Christ in you. And he is uh, the down payment, the deposit, the promise of what? Future glorification. Paul calls that the adoption, the redemption of the body in Romans 8, 23. And so Paul in eight chapters in the book of Romans explains the problem and the solution. And now we get to Romans 9 and Romans 9, 10 and 11 is what we call Israelology 101. Because Paul anticipates the question now, what about Israel? Wasn't Israel God's special covenant nation? Didn't he make special unconditional covenant promises to that nation in the Old Testament? Yes, indeed he did. Well, why are they enemies of the cross right now? Uh, What's happening here? Uh, It was their religious leaders that engineered the judicial murder of Jesus. And most of Israel from Paul's time to this very hour has been locked in unbelief. Rejection of Christ and his claims. And so Paul, he anticipates the question, what about the promises God made to Israel? Has the word of God become of none effect? And in Romans 9, Paul kind of explains what's happening here to us. That God purposely hardened Israel, which was already growing quite apostate, mind you. He just solidified, reinforced, strengthened their resolve. And, um, and Jesus did that in his appearance, in his claims, in the way he talked, the parables. Uh, he, he made them very hostile to him. And for that reason, they, they handed him over to the Romans to be killed. And that accomplished a stupendous redemptive work in the world. 
just like the hardening of Pharaoh in Egypt accomplished a stupendous redemptive work for Israel. And we're supposed to catch the parallelism there, the irony of all this. And we discussed all that. But um, we now want to go to Romans chapter 10. And um, look what Paul says here in Romans 10 verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Well, there you have it. I mean, that, that's probably the end of the replacement theology that's become very popular in North American Christianity. Uh, North American Christianity, becoming very liberal, suggests that Israel in the New Testament is just the church, that the church has replaced Israel. The church is a new Israel. And I don't believe that's true at all here because that wouldn't make a lick of sense. Uh, Paul's heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that it may be saved. If Israel's the church, then he's praying that the church would be saved. Well, that's ridiculous. The church is saved in the nature of the case. The church is saved. The church is Christ's body and bride, right? Redeemed, a chaste virgin, uh, to be presented spotless and faultless before his throne, before him at his coming. I mean, all that just wouldn't make any sense if Paul's talking about the church here. He's talking, obviously, about national ethnic Israel. And I think he's got to be talking about Israel as a whole, the whole nation he's talking about. Because back in uh, Romans 9, 27, it says that the remnant will be saved. So there is a remnant within the elect nation of Israel. There is a remnant that will be saved, guaranteed will be saved. But Paul's prayer here is that Israel will be saved. So he's thinking about the whole nation, obviously. He, and, and he made that very clear right at the beginning of Romans 9. You remember when he said he had continual sorrow and heaviness in his heart for his countrymen, the Jews? And he could wish himself accursed uh, of Christ for their, for their sake. If, they, if He could be accursed for them that they might be redeemed and have a right relationship with God. So his heart really is for his countrymen, the Jews. But look at uh, verse 2 now. He says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Well, um, and then we'll continue on verse 4. This is very important. Let's just... Read verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So in those few verses, uh, we're seeing that data compression again. There's a lot there jam-packed into those verses. The first thing we want to point out here is that religious zeal is not enough. I'm not sure why this is in the world, but people are so discerning about the most mundane, stupid things that hardly matter. I mean, I heard uh, it was a T.A. McMahon, and back in 05, he had a wonderful analogy. He said, um, if you went to the restaurant and you ordered spaghetti and meatballs, and the waitress came out with a plate of spaghetti and golf balls, you would be really bent out of shape about that. You would say, what in the world's this? I didn't order this. Is this some kind of joke? You'd be really not happy. And yet, if the waitress said, well, it's a golf ball, a meatball, what's the difference? Yeah. Yeah, big deal, right? <laughs> you wouldn't accept that. And yet, it seems that in the world of religious ideas, it's like anything goes. Does it make you happy? Good enough. And uh, discernment is not really uh, called for or desired, actually. You're not supposed to be discerning when it comes to religious matters, as long as you're sincere, as long as you have zeal for your chosen religion, that's good enough, people think. Well, that that can't possibly be the case. In the nature of the case, some religious claims are absolutely antithetical to other claims. They're in head-on collision with each other. all, All these competing religious claims can't be true, can they? Islam says Jesus Christ absolutely is not the Son of God. And Christianity absolutely affirms that he is the divine son of God. Now, how are you going to get these two together? Impossible. (laughs) And then you have the secular humanist. Secular humanism is a religion, by the way. uh, And it denies the existence of any gods. Absolutely, there is no God. There's only space, time, matter, and energy. Now, how are you going to bring that into this? How can that be? How can you get agreed with that? You see, some of these ideas have got to be wrong. And um, 
we affirm as Christians there's only one system that's right, and that's the Christian system. But uh, in, in any case, zeal is simply not enough. And Paul says that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And that's sort of key right there. Um, I think it's uh, Hosea 4, 6, where God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And remember what Paul told his favorite disciple, Timothy. He said, Timothy, from a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. There's some things you just have to know, and then uh, some things you have to believe to be saved. So God gives us propositional truth in the Bible, and then he invites you to, to trust that what he's telling you is true, and then to trust in him for salvation. And there's really there's no other way to do this. This is how God is determined to govern man. But uh, zeal is not enough. In fact, zeal without knowledge is a deadly combination. And Paul tells us that. Paul says he was just like these people he's describing. In Acts chapter 22, do you remember what happened? Paul got arrested in Jerusalem. And the religious leaders are about to tear him to pieces. They were beating on him. And the Romans had to rescue him. And uh, they were carrying him up the stairs into the barracks. And Paul said to the soldier, may I address the people? And the soldier stopped and said, okay, go ahead, you do it. And so Paul addressed his countrymen in the Hebrew language. And he said um, that he had a zeal. In fact, his, in his zeal, he was damaging the church. And he actually consented to murder, cold-blooded murder, the murder of Stephen, the first martyr, remember? So that's zeal. That's, that's what zeal without knowledge will get you. You do a, an untold amount of damage if you don't know what you're talking about, if you don't really know the facts, see? So Paul's very concerned about this. Now, the tragedy here is that the ignorance that Israel is suffering under here, they've got zeal, but they've got ignorance, it's a willing ignorance. That's, that's a big problem. It's willful ignorance. In fact, Paul was sort of guilty himself. Do you remember on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, and this is retold in Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26, uh, what happened there? He was on his way to persecute Christians, and who confronted him? Jesus Christ, resurrected to glory. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, and then the Lord said something amazing. He said, Saul, it is hard for you to kick against the ox goads, kick against the pricks. Remember what that is? It's a big, long pole with a pointy end, and they use that to prod the, the livestock animal, move him along, poke him. And it sounds like God was working with Saul. God was trying to push Saul in the right direction in his thought, but Saul was kicking against the pricks, kicking against the ox goads. And that's what religious Israel was doing. In fact, this is what all kinds of people are doing. In Romans, the first chapter, verses 18 to 20, you have a very famous passage there. And that's where Paul says that um, God has made his, exist his existence known to everyone on planet Earth. It says, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are what? Without excuse. So nobody dies in unbelief, goes before God, and then says to God, well, if only you would have given me more evidence, I would have believed. They won't talk like that. God absolutely guarantees they will not talk like that. They'll put their hand over their mouths like Job did, and they will know that they denied and suppressed the truth by means of unrighteousness. They did have the truth. They didn't want it. And Jesus said that is the condemnation. Remember that? In uh, John 3, 19, the Lord says, this is the condemnation. This is why people go to hell. Because light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. And John identifies Jesus Christ in John 1, 9 as the true light, which lightens what? Every man coming into the world. That's everyone born. So everyone has a measure of truth from God about God. But the, the tragedy is most people don't like it. They don't like this God very much. They don't want to submit to God. That we're going to see yet. They don't want God to be a Lord over their lives. As a matter of fact, I just saw something horrible this week. I can hardly imagine this is real, but it's real in North America. 
Who's ever heard of the After School Satan Club? You ever hear this? Unbelievable. Yeah, they're popping up like mushrooms in North America. After School Satan Clubs for kids. Teaching kids that Satan is going to show them the way to truth. And Satan's not a bad guy, and they have little songs for the children to learn all about Satan. Now, the Satan Club, of course, goes on to tell you that they don't actually believe in Satan. He's just a figurehead. He's just an idea, a concept, which symbolizes what? Their rejection of theocratic tyranny. That's what they call it, theocratic tyranny. It's a bid for human autonomy. They, they come in right out and tell you, we will not have this man to reign over us. Not God, not his beloved son, Jesus. And so they adopt Satan as their mascot. And they're just tipping their hand. They're just showing us what's really in their hearts. And they say that uh, they don't, they're not going to follow any gods. They're going to follow science and reason. Kids, let's follow science and reason. All the while, never bothering to, uh, to consider the obvious. Hello, you wouldn't have any science or reason if there wasn't a God in heaven establishing what? The objective standards for both and the promised uniformity of natural process that you absolutely need to conduct any meaningful scientific investigation. You absolutely need to have it. And that means inductive reasoning. And inductive reasoning has no rational foundation apart from the guarantees of the God of heaven who created the world. So I have a good mind to reach out to these people and have a dialogue with them. Pray for me. I really I feel aggravated by this. <laughs> I feel that someone should do something, anyhow. Um, but it's willful ignorance because they don't want God telling them how to live. Do you remember Psalm 2? Remember how that one begins? Why do the, uh, the nations rage and the heathen imagine a vain thing? And they talk about, let's cast off their cords from us. They rise up against the Lord and his Christ. Let's, let's break their cords. Let's not have them telling us how to live. And it says that the one who reigns in heaven will laugh. He will hold them in derision. You, you can't... How, how about this one? Do you remember Pilate's wife came to him? This is in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, 27th chapter. She came to Pilate and she said, have nothing to do with this just man, Jesus. I've suffered many things because of him in a dream. Do you know what that is? That's impossible. Have nothing to do with this just man. You will have something to do with him. We all will. <laughs> Even these people who want to deny and suppress the truth by means of unrighteousness, they'll have something to do with Jesus. They're going to go before him one day and they'll give an account of everything they've done during their time on the earth. What, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, friends. And um, so this, I mean, these are serious matters. But um, I want us to look at first, um, let's make it 2 Peter. Just look at 2 Peter chapter 3, please. 2 Peter 3. This is what the... Uh, the spokesman for the apostles is going to talk a little bit about willing ignorance. Willing ignorance. You know better, but you don't want to know better. See, this is complicated. There is such a thing, friends, as self-deception. It happens all the time. Self-deception. I'm not sure if we talked about it yet in this course, but people know that God exists, but they don't want to know that God exists. So guess what people have? They have two orders of conflicting beliefs. They have a true belief about God. Everybody has this belief a true belief about God, namely that God exists. That's a true belief. Everyone has it. But some people have a false belief about themselves, namely that they don't believe in God. And that makes them, at a, to a certain extent, that makes them kind of schizophrenic. It's a kind of schizophrenia. I mean, it, I don't mean to be rude, but it's true. They have these conflicting beliefs. It's a, the thief has the same problem. The thief steals your wallet. And in his mind, this is my wallet, but it's not my wallet, right? And all sin is insanity. And denying God, denying the existence of God, that is this, I think that's the purest form of insanity, because everyone knows that God exists deep down in their heart of hearts. But 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3, look what Peter says here. He says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. 
You know what these people are? They're willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. They don't want to acknowledge God as the creator of the world, because that means he's in charge, and they don't want to acknowledge God as the judge of the world, so they're going to deny the creation and the worldwide flood. And notice that in verse 3 it says that these people are scoffing and um, walking after their own lusts. So I say that all forms of religious heresy have a moral foundation. And it's because they don't want God to be God in their lives. And to that extent, I think they're a bit schizophrenic. They want to be men of science, but they can't justify the science that they're engaged in. They want to say everything continues as it was from the beginning of the world, a strict, um, uninterrupted uniformity to natural process, which means God has never judged the world in the past. He never will in the future, therefore. It's a strict uniformity, but they can't even justify that commitment to this strict uniformitarianism. Not unless you've got some guarantee from the creator himself who made the world, which is what they deny. So it makes the whole worldview um, a bit insane, I think, just to put it bluntly here. So they willfully forget. Now, willfully forget, this is coming now, this is a literal translation from the Cambridge Bible for colleges and universities. It says, this is hid from them by their own will. Hid from them by their own will. Uh, Marvin R. Vincent's another Greek scholar, a very famous Greek scholar. He interprets the verse like this. This escapes them of their own will. And A.T. Robertson, another Greek scholar, says, uh, he interprets the verse, this escapes them being willing. And I think this is what's happening with Israel. They know better but they don't want to know better. This is the problem with most of humanity right now. They know that God exists, but they don't like God very much. And I've had discussions with atheists like that. I wonder if you have. They were sitting on the phone for three hours with this young lady from, I think she was University of Calgary or something. Do you remember her? Lethbridge? I just can't remember. Three hours. We start off, there's no God. I don't believe in God. There's no evidence. I lay out the case for God. By the time we're done, She's changed her tune completely. Now she says, well, I don't like that God. I don't like how he operates. I don't like how he governs man. Okay, we could have saved three hours. You were faking it all along, weren't you? I had to talk to her like that too. We pull the mask off the hypocrisy. So I think this is a little bit of what's happening with Israel too. And um, this ignorance, this willful ignorance, I think you kind of see a little something like this in Mark chapter 4. Do you guys want to go back please to the Gospel of Mark? Chapter 4, I'll show you something here that um, it might be helpful to us when we're thinking about ignorance, ignorance of God, his person, his personality, uh, the way he's a governed man, what he demands of man, and so on. Mark chapter 4 might be helpful to us. In Mark chapter 4, we're in the, of course, we're in the days of the Lord's earthly ministry, and he's speaking in parables to people. And it says in verse 10, Mark 4, 10, but when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may, they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Speaking in parables to accomplish these goals. Now, if you just read that, it kind of sounds like God doesn't want people saved. It kind of sounds like, well, God has chosen the people he wants to go to heaven, and uh, the rest of them he doesn't want in heaven. And that kind of, it kind of fits with a Reformed Calvinistic perspective on things, where God unconditionally elects some to salvation, others to damnation, and yet it wouldn't comport very well with the Calvinistic doctrine of total depravity because a totally depraved person wouldn't need Jesus to speak in parables, would he? The totally depraved person wouldn't be able to understand anyhow. So, there, so the speaking in parables would be a, a totally unnecessary step, I think. I think what's happening here is that you've got people who aren't really that interested in Christ and his claims. Just like John chapter 6. They're in proximity to Jesus, 
They're associated with Jesus, but they're really not that interested. And the Lord Jesus gives a hard teaching, and just like Hebrews 4 goes on to say, the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and the hard teaching from Jesus reveals what's in the hearts of all those people in his audience. And some of them say, this is dumb. I'm out of here. I'm done wasting my time with this foolishness. And other people, they draw close to the Savior. Lord Jesus, tell us what you meant. We want to know. And right there, his word has been a discerner, a revealer of what's really going on uh, in people's hearts. And so there's a lot going on here. I think that things could have been otherwise. At any time, these people could have drawn near to Jesus like the 12 did and those around them did. So here in verse 11, it says, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. To who? To those who drew near to Jesus. To you guys. To to them on the outside, no. They're going to be locked in ignorance because that's how they want it. That's what they want. And um, by the way, the fact that those guys got locked in ignorance only contributed to Israel's rejection of her Messiah and therefore his redemptive work on the cross. Now, today, in this dispensation, we know that God, I believe, I think I know, that God wants everyone saved. And you got your proof right here because this secret teaching that was only revealed to those who came close to Jesus at Christ's command, was inscripturated into the Bible for everyone to understand now. See? I think I, I kind of see that going on here. And in fact, if you go back to uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, um, it's 29. You see a little something here. I think there's a little hint here. Deuteronomy 29. Uh, yes. 29.2, you'll see what I think is happening here. 29.2. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials which, which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see, and ears to hear to this day, to this very day. (coughs) Now again, if you just read that, you think, wow, I guess God likes his people locked in ignorance. I guess he doesn't doesn't want them to know the truth or something. But when I read the rest of the Bible, I don't think that's true at all here. I think the reason why he didn't give them these things is because they didn't ask for these things. I think there's a principle in the Bible who remembers uh, James chapter 4. And verse 2, it says, You have not because you ask not. James chapter 1 and verse 5 contains a promise. If you ask for wisdom, God will give it liberally and abradeth not. He will not give you a hard time. If you ask wisdom, he will grant you the wisdom. Remember what Jesus said? Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. So again, I think there's a principle here. People who don't want the truth Um, God is not obligated to give them truth. I mean, God has given a measure of truth to everyone on the planet. If you respond affirmatively to it, he'll give you more truth. But if you don't, he's under no obligation to give you more to trample underfoot. (laughs) Cornelius the centurion, remember him? He was not saved. But he did respond affirmatively to whatever truth reached him from God about God. And because he did that, Uh, God gave him more truth. And that truth came by way of what? The apostolic witness. The gospel. He said, uh, Cornelius, the angel told Cornelius, send for Peter who will give you words by which you will be saved. You must be saved. So that tells me that Cornelius, who gets a good report card from God, who by nature was able to do the things contained in the law, even though he was unregenerate, um, that tells me he needed to hear the apostolic witness and believe it to be saved. Nothing's, nothing's changed in our world today. Yeah, Peter? Well, then, I just don't see how that's very consistent, though, to Paul's converting. Because if anything, he did everything he could to go against the faith. 
right? And to remain in ignorance. Right, that's why God said, you're kicking against the pricks. Mm-hmm. Remember, Paul, God said that to Paul, you're kicking against the pricks. I've been prodding you in the right direction, but you refuse to go, right? But the idea that if you choose, if you will yourself to remain in ignorance, God will push you in that direction. Oh, no. that I think before. God can govern man however he wants. He, God, he, God can govern man however he wants. But with, with Paul, he gave him a blinding light and a voice from heaven, and Paul was converted on the spot. Mm-hmm. Some people see supernatural sign miracles, and they remain in their unbelieving state. Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. 500 people on a Galilean mountain saw him, and the Apostle Matthew says some doubted. So some people will be converted by this, some people will not. Because we're not cookie-cutter people, right? We're individuals. We're, we're not automatons, robots, or cookie-cutter people. Everyone's redemptive history, history is just a little bit different than everyone else's. I like that. I like that we're individuals. There's wonderful diversity in the midst of this unity. So, I don't know if that helps, if that speaks well, at all to your... We're, we're just, but we're created individuals, right? Yes, but we share human nature. We share that... Um, we share the image of God, all of us. It unifies us, right? Mm-hmm. And we're all given identities as they relate to God's plan, too. So that unifies all of humanity, even though we're wonderfully diverse, too. And that's a mysterious um, combination there, unity and diversity. So, um, okay, so I think that people could know better, but they just don't because they don't want to. It seems to me, and that's something I've been arguing all through the course, that people can do better than they do, and therefore they're culpable. See verse 3, if we go back to um, um, Romans chapter 10 and verse 3, Romans 10, 3, here we go. They being ignorant of God's righteousness, willing ignorance, I'm convinced, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. They have not submitted. I think that's the problem there. It doesn't say they could not. It says they have not. I think that they could do it. They just won't. And by the way, submitting takes no special uh, ability. You don't have to have a special ability or talent to submit. It's just surrender. Put down your weapon. Stop fighting. But see, pride is the issue. I'm convinced that pride is the issue. Uh, God deals in the currency of faith, right? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And that has not changed. That is the currency that God still deals in. I mean, that's 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus. In Romans chapter 4, Paul says this still is in place, this transaction where you put your faith in God in whatever revelation he gives you of himself and what he expects of you, today it's the gospel, and he will impute to you his righteousness. So faith is the currency, but I do not believe that you can be a proud person and exercise saving faith. I I think it's oil and water. Those things cannot work together. How can you be a proud person and yet believe God when he tells you that you are a wicked sinner not worthy of the least of his mercies? How could you still be proud and believe that? You couldn't, right? And Israel refuses to humble herself and believe what God tells her about herself and about his ways. But um, the fact that man makes free choice, he makes real choices, and he can do better than he does, I think is outlined in spectacular fashion back in Jeremiah chapter 36. I'd like us to go, please, to Jeremiah 36. And um, this is going to be the knockdown, drag him out, Uh, verse passage that I'm going to really stand on here because I think it really illustrates what I've been trying to teach and defend in this course. I know not everyone's with me on this. That's totally fine. You love me. I love you. It's okay. But I've been trying to say in the course that God has given man, all men, a real and legitimate measure of self-determination so that man is responsible for what he does or doesn't do. And that's why man is in big trouble when he doesn't submit to God, because he can do it. I really believe that. 
But here in Jeremiah 36, I'd like us to just read from verse 1. I'm going to read the first seven verses. And I want you to pay attention to the language, please. Jeremiah 36, 1. Now it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll of a book and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah even to this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the adversities which I purpose to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll of a book at the instructions of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken to him. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am confined, I cannot go into the house of the Lord. You go, therefore, and read from the scroll which you have written at my instruction the words of the Lord in the hearing of the people in the Lord's house on the day of fasting. And you shall also read them in the hearing of all Judah who come from their cities. It may be that they will repent, or sorry, that they will present. I will wear glasses one day, I promise you. (laughs) They will present their supplication before the Lord and everyone will turn from his evil way. That's repentance, by the way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord has pronounced against this people. Okay, I almost made it without messing up. Look at verse 3 again. Look at what God says. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the adversities that I purpose to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way. Do you see the language that God is using here speaks of contingency regarding the future. Do you see that? Now, on Calvinism, on the Calvinist reform view, God has already decreed whatsoever comes to pass. God has rendered certain, absolutely every human decision, whatever comes to pass. But that is not how God is talking here to Jeremiah. God is saying, these people, you read this to them, Jeremiah, they may change their mind. Maybe all of them will change their mind. Maybe everyone who hears you will change their mind. Now, God, of course, let's be honest, let's be clear, let's get agreed. God, of course, knows infallibly every future human choice, right? God knows 100%. He's not guessing. He knows absolutely what all our future free choices are going to be. That's not the issue here. The issue is, could things be different? Are these people actually able to repent and turn from their wicked ways at the hearing of God's word being written and being read to them, I should say? And it sounds like, yes. God says, I know what they're going to do, but they could have done different. They can do different. It, It says they may. It may be that everyone may turn from his evil way. They may do it. They've been granted the ability. See, that's how God's talking here. So God knows that people will choose to do certain things infallibly. He knows that. And they could do otherwise. It's just that they don't. And when they choose not to obey, then they're in trouble. That's the reason. That's why they're in trouble, because they could do differently. Do you see that? And again, I'm going to maintain like I did earlier in the course, that God's knowledge of the future is not what's making that future happen. See, the past is gone. The future is not yet, right? And we have something to say about what happens in that future. We have some say. God knows infallibly what we're going to do, but you're not a puppet on a string, and I'm not either. I don't believe we are. And Jeremiah's the language here in Jeremiah 36 kind of bears that out. You have a question there, Peter? Uh, I have a comment on that. He did not make anyone reject him. I don't think so either. There's a, well, and we looked at... I think that's what he meant by everyone may repent. Right. Correct. And again, um, I would just refer us back to Isaiah, the fifth chapter, where um, in Isaiah 5, God sort of um, reminds the nation of all he's done for them. And he likens them to a vineyard. 
and uh, a grapevine and all that. And he says, but when I came to get grapes, I got these wild, stinky grapes. And he says, what more could I have done for my vineyard? What more could I have done? And again, I think that on a reformed view, he could have extended irresistible grace. But on the view that I'm sort of sharing and trying to defend here, when God gives man a real legit measure of self-determination, um, God can only do so much to convince a person. You just can't force someone to freely do something. That's a contradiction in terms. And God doesn't deal in contradictions. I don't believe it. Because contradictions, uh, contradictions are the character of lying. and God can't lie. Contradictions engage in nonsense, too. Five-sided triangles and married bachelors are contradictions in terms. They're nonsense things. God does not deal in contradiction or nonsense or lies. Okay, So that's, that's very powerful. But I think that's, that's what I'm trying to get through here in, the, in this course, that our basic intuitions on things do map onto the scriptures. You feel like you're making real choices, and it's because you are making real choices. And that's why it's such a big deal when we don't choose correctly. Okay? Does that make sense to everyone? Kind of, sort of? Is everything clear? Do you have any questions, any clarification? Okay. I'm not asking you to agree with all that, but if you understand all that, where we're coming from. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, where in the world are we here? Uh, Jeremiah 36. Right. Okay. Let's look at Romans 10. Back to Romans 10, please, and verse 4. And this is not controversial now. So we get back into the stuff we can all agree on, no problem. Uh, Acts 10.4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Uh, again, Israel after the flesh is attempting to establish their own righteousness by their works. That's the whole issue here. Paul is very big on the faith versus works stuff. Grace versus works. And Paul is going to hammer on that constantly. And he says, Israel after the flesh, they're attempting to establish their own righteousness by their works, by their efforts. And this is impossible. Impossible. It cannot happen. And again, pride's the issue, right? That's the big problem with all false religion. It's the difference between do this or done. Do this and you go to heaven. Or do this and you're in a right relationship with God. Or your, fin your sins are forgiven or whatever. That's false religion. True religion says it's done. Believe in Jesus for salvation, right? Because Jesus Christ is the covenant keeper. He's the perfect observer of the law, right? And when you receive Jesus for salvation, you are in him. You be, you're in him, and that means you're acceptable in him. That means you're perfect in him. And that means God regards you as a covenant keeping observer of the law also. In Christ, in Christ. So Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. But Christ is also the whole point of the law. He's not just the end of the law in that respect, that in him you're considered a law a keeper and a covenant keeper. The law was pointing, pointing ahead to Jesus. So Paul in Galatians 3, he calls the law our schoolmaster. A schoolmaster was the attendant slave, a servant, a household servant, who brought the children to school, to synagogue school, or some other institution of learning. And the law was pointing us to Jesus. And uh, now that Christ has come, Paul says, we don't need that schoolmaster anymore. We don't need that law. Uh, Paul writes to his favorite disciple, Timothy. Remember that? He says in, in 1 Timothy 1, he says, um, well, we know the law is for bad people. For uh, manslayers and perjurers and adulterers, the law is for all those guys, N not for Christians. Uh, we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We have new hearts, new minds. We have the mind of Christ. What do we need the law for? As a schoolmaster, no need. It's, it's not that the law is worthless. It's just that as law, we're not under the law. We don't need to be under the law anymore. And, um, and furthermore, the law itself, according to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, the law itself taught its own inadequacy. Do you remember in Hebrews 10, the writer there goes on to say that, um, he says, gentlemen, if you just think about it, 
Every year, you've got a high priest going into that holiest place, the holy place there in, in the temple. Every year, a guy goes in there to do what? To cover the sins of Israel for another year. Now, why does he have to keep doing this? Because the system's inadequate. If, if it could really handle the sin problem that we face, that high priest would go in there once and be done with it. But the fact that this goes on and on and on is teaching us something. It's pedagogical, too. It, I mean... It is efficacious for the sanctifying of the flesh. The sacrificing of, of innocent animals and the applying of their blood did protect people, worshippers, offerers, from immediate judgment of sin in their flesh from a holy God. That's true. And the writer goes on to tell you that. It was efficacious for the sanctifying of the flesh, the purifying of the flesh. But only the blood of Christ could cleanse the conscience, the heart, the mind. Only the blood of Christ could really bear away the sin of the world and our sins personally. So that's, that's in, important. And furthermore, the law contained outright predictive prophecy concerning Christ the Lord, Savior of the world. And Deuteronomy 18 is the big one. Remember that? Where Moses said, God will raise up from among you, from among your brethren, a prophet like me. And he'll put his words in him and you will be obligated to listen to him because if you don't, it will be required of you. And in the New Testament, that is very clearly um, quoted as referring to Jesus. The apostles recognized that uh, Mosaic prophecy as referring to Christ the Lord. So Christ, yes, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes in many ways, right? He, the law points to Jesus in many ways. Pastor, he, yeah. I just want to make a little clear that when Paul says that we're not under the law, we're under grace, mm -hmm. he was not talking about the whole law, but he was talking about the ceremonial law. That's why Jesus says, many will come unto me, the last day, and says, Lord, there is that will be with many, good many miracles in your name, and says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Mm -hmm. Because they were saying that we are no under the law, but the law that we still obey and keep is this. The civil law and the moral law, but the ceremonial law is done away. We are not under that. That's why Paul said. I've heard that. I've heard that before, <laughs> and uh, my mentor believes that also. But I, I deny that. I think that that's that distinction, that division there between the different kinds of law in in the Mosaic law. I think those distinctions are artificial. I think the entire law as law has been set aside. So, but that's something we can talk about. But if you, even if you think about the Ten Commandments, for example, right? Think about the Ten Commandments. Um, am I under that first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Do I need that commandment? I'm not sure I do. Because Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? He says, On those two hang all the law and the prophets. So those two commandments are of a different order. There's something else now. And so you can jettison the Mosaic Law and the Ten Commandments and guess what? You'll still keep them. Because if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you'll keep that first commandment. It would be ridiculous that you would bow down to a different God. If you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I won't blaspheme his name, I won't take his name in vain, and, um, and just go down the whole line. If I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I love my neighbor as myself, guess what I won't do? I won't covet what my neighbor has. I won't cheat, I won't cheat with his wife. And I won't murder him. <laughs> and I won't steal from him. And I just think that uh, the Apostle Paul, and in fact, um, we actually get to it in Romans 13. I'll just read it just to... Um, just to bring this out here, Romans uh, 13 and verse 8, it says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And that's how I choose to understand the Bible here. That the, the Mosaic law is done with. It's done away with. 
There's lots of verse passages that talk about this. But uh, love remains. The greatest is love. It's the greatest of the virtues. And Paul tells us that if we love God with everything we have and we love our neighbors as ourselves, we've fulfilled the spirit of the law. Okay, go ahead there, uh, Jared. This may be going a little bit off topic, but would this have anything to do with connecting to the law that we're under of the spirit? Uh, is the spirit worse? Because the spirit is, in fact, completing as we work. It's him who's attributing righteousness to us as we go. It's not us, it's him. So would that link these ideas together a little bit? I need to think about what you're saying there more before I can give a complete answer. Uh, I'm just going to stay with what I said. Yeah. That uh, love is the fulfilling of the law. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, Anyway, maybe, maybe next year we should do a whole thing on law and grace. <laughs> we should go verse by verse through that sometime. Law and grace. But we're, just skimming on, we're just skimming the surface of some of these things now. But, um, but that's kind of where I land on, on this issue. But... Um, Okay, in Romans uh, 10 and verse 5, I'll just finish up with verse 5. Verse 5, For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. And of course, this is impossible. This is abs- the law was intended to kind of show us that, right? Um, Paul will actually tell us in uh, Romans chapter 5 and in Romans chapter 8, that the law was given so that sin might become exceeding sinful, right? The law was given so that the offense might abound. The law was given to show us how bad we really are, how incapable we are of attaining to God's righteous requirements. That's one of the purposes of the law too. And um, again, once, once the law has done its job, then you don't need it anymore. You come to Christ for salvation and new birth, imputed righteousness, a new heart, new mind, and you have a new master now, right? And, um, but in any, case, in any case, not only were we unable to keep the letter of the law, we for sure can't keep the, the spirit of the law without God's help. Do you remember James 2.10 says, if you keep the whole law but stumble in one point, you're guilty of everything. So that's just everyone. Uh, all, have some, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God And then if that weren't bad enough, here comes Jesus of Nazareth to give a Sermon on the Mount, and then he amplifies the restrictions. He explains, he gives you a divine commentary on the Mosaic Law. And he says, in effect, don't come to me and say, well, I never murdered anyone, because I'll just say, because he'll say to you, but you thought about it. You hated your brother without a cause, that's murder, right there. And James knew about that too. He says, you have wars and you, mur- you have murders among you. Murders in the church? Yes, people hating on each other for no good reason. And he says, you're guilty of murder. Right? Well, I never cheated on my wife. Yeah, but you, you were thinking about it with the neighbor lady or whatever. Aha, you're guilty. You've committed adultery already in your heart, Jesus said. Right? Now, when you understand the, the law and you understand that the standards are that high, a couple things come to mind. I'll just close with this, okay guys? The first thing that comes to mind when I'm confronted with the righteous requirements of a holy God, number one, this is not man's invention, this book. No way, Jose. The moral prescriptions in this book are so high, no one can reach them. Obviously, they were put in place from above. That's number one. Wouldn't, we, would, we would at least write a book, a fiction book, with some moral prescriptions that someone can attain to, but no one can. So I, that shows me that the book is of supernatural divine origin. Um, and number two, I say, I'm just going to have to throw myself on the mercy of God here. Because um, I'm going to hell otherwise. Right? Is that, did you ever come? You have to come to that realization, right? You have to mourn for your sin and you have to throw yourself on the mercy of God. You're going to be like that repentant publican. Remember the tax collector? It says he beat his breast. He couldn't even look up to heaven. He said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said on his own authority that that guy went home justified that day. And that, that's, what, that's what a personal redemptive history has to include. 
that, that realization. Hey. So that's very powerful, but it's also the best news anyone's ever heard. <laughs> the God of heaven is willing to forgive. If you'll come to him, confess your sin and forsake it. Uh, he, he'll come into your life and change everything. It's my story. I think that's yours too. Okay, I'll just stop there at Romans 10.5. Any other concluding thoughts or questions or comments on anything? I would say the last part of the five there, the man who does those things shall live by them. I'm not really sure, I'm not sure what that means. Well, the idea is that in principle, in principle, a person that could keep the Mosaic law and all of its implications too, including the amplified restrictions that Jesus gave us in the Sermon on the Mount, in principle, if a person could do it, they would have eternal life. But no one can, except for Jesus. He's the only one. I think that's what Paul's trying to say there. Um, the man who does those things shall live by them. His perfect obedience to God will have grant, would have merited the eternal life. But, um, but it's impossible. You may as well say, well, jump to the moon. Impossible. I like with Dr. John Whitcomb. I love his analogy. He said, it's like um, lining up the world's greatest long jumpers on the uh, eastern seashore. And you say, okay, guys, you're going to jump to Europe. <laughs> get a good start, get a good running start, and go for it. And guess what happens? The guy who jumps the farthest, he sinks the deepest. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> Impossible. And to attain to God's righteous standards on your own, it's, it's orders of magnitude more ridiculous than a guy trying to jump the Atlantic, for sure. So, but the law was intended to teach us those things also, right? Okay. Okay, guys, I'm going to close us off with a prayer, and then you're certainly welcome to uh, visit and enjoy each other's company. A dear, blessed, and holy God of heaven, we thank you today, Lord, for being here with us and for opening your precious word to us. And uh, Lord, these are the deep things. This is the college level stuff. And we thank you, Lord, that you gave us an intellect that we can exercise. And we thank you for the joy of learning and discovering new things in your Bible. And we thank you, Lord, even for uh, the debates and dialogues that we can have here when we don't quite see things the same. It's wonderful also to sharpen one another and to hear new perspectives also on these verses and uh, Lord may this continue to be the case here where we help each other and we guide each other along here in the Bible we commit the rest of the evening to your tender care and ministry O God for your glory and for the good of your people in Jesus precious name we pray it amen and amen okay, praise God okay God bless you guys and thanks for coming out tonight